thank you very much for standing in line or whatever you had to do to come see me talk. Um, this is awesome. I'm Decius. Uh, I'm so stoked to be speaking at, uh, at DEF CON. Um, I, uh, it's pretty easy to figure out who I, who I really am in real life and what company I work for. Um, and I want to make it clear that I'm here speaking on my own behalf. I'm not here as a representative of my employer. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about is uh, surveillance systems in the internet um, and, and how, they, how they work and, and actually some concerns I have about how they're architected. Uh, so um, there's this great debate that's been going on um, for years now about the nature of surveillance in the internet infrastructure in the future. Um, you know, are we going to have end-to-end -end encryption so that surveillance of our communications is essentially impossible? Uh, or are we going to have systems that are built into the internet that enable the government to surveil our communications when they decide that they, uh, they need to? So one of the first sort of salvos in this discussion was the clipper chip. Um, the clipper chip was a, a, a crypto system that had a back door so the government could access the contents. Um, it also had a flaw, uh, which uh, uh, was discovered by uh, some cryptographers and uh, as a consequence, uh, um, uh, you know, didn't become as popular as they thought it was going to. Uh, th that was in the early 1990s. Around the same period of time, uh, the U.S. government passed a law called the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act. This law requires telecommunications companies to create uh, interfaces that allow law enforcement to perform surveillance. Uh, the, uh, the, the reason for this law, uh, at least the, the justification for the law that was presented, is that telecommunications networks are getting more and more complicated. And so it used to be the case that, you know, if you wanted to wiretap somebody, you could go out and with your uh, uh, alligator clips and hook up to a junction box. Um, and as, as the systems have become more sophisticated, it's more complicated to do that. And so they said, we need an interface that allows us to collect this data. Um, Originally, there was this uh, agreement negotiated within Calia uh, such that um, it only applied to what we consider to be voice telecommunication systems, and that data telecommunication or data internet networks like that, uh, you know, were not it, it didn't apply to them. Uh, and in 2005, the FCC uh, made a ruling that that said that broadband internet providers were telecommunications companies, um, and so Calia did apply to them. Uh, and so now we're beginning to see uh, this technology rolled out into the internet. Uh, in fact, in Europe, uh, various governments required uh, th this kind of technology to be rolled out into internet networks before the United States did. So the IETF got involved, uh, and they published an RFC in the year 2000, which talks about whether or not the IETF will consider requirements for wiretapping when they're designing uh, the protocols that the internet is based on. And they decided that they would not do that. And there's a bunch of different reasons why. Um, one of the reasons that they stated was this sort of dichotomy that, ex that, that a lot of people think exists, um, where uh, they think that wiretapping will, in the future will either be easy or impossible. Uh, because we either have end-to-end -to -end encryption or we do not. If we have end-to-end -end encryption, you can't wiretap. If we don't, then you hook up somewhere where things aren't encrypted and you don't need an interface built in for that. So um, the, the, uh, one of the other arguments they made is that it, the internet should be free from security loopholes. And so if you built interfaces into the internet that enabled wiretapping, um, someone might misuse them. Someone might gain unauthorized access to them. Uh, and uh, Th that's a concern, so perhaps we shouldn't design those weaknesses in. Uh, however, they did say that if, if you were going to design a surveillance system into the internet, uh, that you should tell everyone how you did it. You should publish the details of your architecture. Um, and there's two reasons for that. The first is that it allows peer review. People can take a look at your architecture and see if there are any security weaknesses in it. Um, and the second thing is really that almost all of the uh, architectural, uh, uh, you know, underpinnings of the internet are available for all of us to read in RFCs. Uh, and so if you had some surveillance system that was a part of the internet infrastructure uh, that was secret and no one could understand how it worked, then that would almost be antithetical to the way that, uh, you know, we go about designing the internet. So. Um, in keeping with that policy, Cisco published uh, an RFC that, ex that described the interface that they built within Cisco routers uh, for performing wiretaps. Uh, 
the um, it's not an internet standard uh, because the ITF decided they wouldn't have those, but they published Cisco's architecture within the IESG uh, so that it would be freely available within the same documentation set and you can go read about it. Um, Cisco had to build this because their customers demanded it and because the governments the, the, of, of the countries their customers are operating in uh, essentially forced them to. Um, and and it's, uh, the architecture they decided on was based on uh, some previous technical standards that were defined by the European uh, Telecommunication Standards Institute, ETSI. Uh, some of these ETSI standards are available online. You can find them uh, on uh, cryptome.org. Uh, so the way it works is it's an SNMP v3 interface um, and uh, by sending an SNMP v3 request uh, you can uh, provision a wiretap. Um, and it's available in a, in a bunch of different um, sort of edge routers that large ISPs would be using. Let's talk about the architecture a little bit. Uh, this diagram is from the RFC uh, and, and some of the entities in this diagram are actual pieces of equipment and some of the entities are uh, organizations of people. Uh, the first organization of people is the LEA, that's the law enforcement agency. Uh, they um, get permission to, uh, uh, to, to wiretap a suspect and they bring it to the ISP. Uh, and the LI administration function is this organization of people in the ISP who handle this interface for law enforcement. Um, so law enforcement comes to them with the warrant, they validate that the warrant is valid, uh, and they go ahead and provision the wiretap. Um, you can actually outsource your uh, lawful intercept administration function if you're a large ISP. Uh, this is just marketing material from a number of different companies that offer to perform this service for you. So they hire lawyers and they have people who understand the technology. Uh, and so when, the, when, the, when law enforcement wants to access your network, they provide the access. Um, the, the wiretap is provisioned using this thing called a mediation device. The mediation device is really the heart of the wiretapping system. Uh, and and it, uh, what it does is it sends interception requests to various intercept access points, um, various places where you can collect data. Um, the data is collected and then it's sent back to the mediation device and the mediation device packs it and sends it on to the law enforcement agency. So um, there's two kinds of, uh, well, before I get there, I'm going to talk about mediation device vendors. Uh, this is just a partial list of vendors who make mediation devices that are compatible with the Cisco architecture for lawful intercepts. So there's a bunch of different companies out there that make this technology. Um, this, uh, that uh, picture is, is uh, from one of the companies, they're called Verant. I, I picked their pictures out because they have really nice looking marketing material. Um, uh, so I, I want to point something out uh, uh, about this picture. So this, this sort of describes the process that they're going through. At the top there's a warrant uh, and the warrant is, is uh, you know, enables them to uh, use this technology to find this red individual who's the target amongst all of this other communication that's going on and we filter the red individual out and now we have actionable intelligence uh, based on our monitoring of that person. That's the technology they're selling. So th I just want to point out that there are other products that these companies make um, and a number of the different companies in the list including Verant also have in, 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 as opposed to lawful intercept solutions, they also have mass intercept solutions. And they have marketing material about their mass intercept solutions. So this is, a, this is the marketing picture for their mass intercept solution. There is no warrant at the top. Uh, there are a large number of people there. None of them is identified as the individual target. Uh, the technology actually filters out um, a list of a number of different new suspects for them to investigate. So uh, that's a, a completely different kind of technology technology, I don't know exactly how it works or in what context it's sold. Perhaps it's only for use in war zones, I don't know. Um, but uh, I thought it was interesting, I thought you would think it was interesting. Um, so let's go back to the subject at hand. Uh, the, the, this is lawful intercept. The, um, the, the, the mediation device uh, accesses two different kinds of intercept access points. Uh, um, there is the, there's the IRI IAP over on the side there and then there's a content IAP. This is a consequence of this ancient distinction that uh, most Western legal systems make uh, regarding what kind of authority law enforcement needs in order to access certain kinds of information. Um, so 
uh, the most the most ancient kind of telecommunication system is a letter, and usually letters have envelopes, and the addresses are on the outside of the envelope. So uh, your postman can tell who you're receiving letters from and who you're sending letters to. Uh, and so uh, that's not as private as the contents that are inside the envelope. And most Western legal systems acknowledge that distinction. Uh, and they, they say that, that if law enforcement wants to know who you're sending letters to and who you're receiving them from, uh, they, they need a certain level of, uh, of, of uh, suspicion and a certain amount of documentation. And if they want to actually open the envelopes and view the content inside, they need to, they need to establish a greater level of suspicion and they need to have even more documentation and uh, uh, authorization. So um, this uh, actually ends up impacting this technical architecture in the internet where you have these IRI IAPs that only collect addressing information. They collect to and from addresses uh, and other things like that. And then on the other hand, you have content IAPs. Uh, and content IAPs can collect the entirety of a communication and not just the headers. Uh, so I'm going to forget about IRI IAPs. Um, I, I, a number of them are manufactured by the different companies that on the list in the previous slide. Um, Cisco routers are content IAPs. They provide the full content. So. Um, if we go back to this diagram here, you can see this interception request gets sent from the mediation device to the content IAP. The interception request tells the content IAP what content we want to collect, and that content is sent back to the mediation device by the content IAP. The interception request is an SNMP v3 request. It's a single UDP packet that goes from the mediation device to the router. It tells the router everything that the router needs to know about the wiretap. Uh, what addresses, uh, what IP source and destination addresses you want to collect, uh, what source and destination port numbers you want to collect, um, and where to send the content. Uh, where, where does the output go? Um, and also what transport to send it over. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, these are just little pieces of the MIB for the interception request. There's actually a whole bunch of different information that can be specified in this request. And the whole MIB has been published. Uh, you can Google it. It's called the TAP MIB. Um, so let's look at, uh, you know, the reason that uh, the ITF said that these, these things should be published is so that we can look at them from a security perspective and, and see whether or not we're, uh, we think that they're, they're strong or weak. Uh, and um, that's what I'm, I'm trying to do with this work. So uh, let's, let's consider, um, you know, what security concerns exist for lawful intercept. Um, uh, and, and I don't evaluate all of these issues in this talk. I'm only focused on the, the third one, but I wanted to mention all of them so we have like a full framework for how you analyze these things. Um, th so the first thing that you need to consider if you were going to design a system for wiretapping is that you need to make sure that the subject does not, cannot figure out that he's being wiretapped. And if you go read the uh, RFCs for the Cisco interface for lawful intercept, they explain how they go about doing that. They talk about how you don't want to have an additional hop that shows up in the trace route when wiretaps are happening, for example. Uh, so uh, th there are certain decisions they made to, uh, to make it invisible to the user. Um, it's possible that at, when this feature is enabled, uh, it could affect the performance of the router, but it might be difficult to differentiate that from other things that can affect the performance of the router. Uh, so the, the, and I didn't evaluate that, so I'm not absolutely certain. Um, the, the second thing you need to consider is, is, and there's a really awesome paper by Matt Blaze called The Eavesdropper's Dilemma, and if you're, if you're interested in this, I highly recommend reading it. Um, he talks about how if you're an eavesdropper, what do you do with data that's malformed? Uh, what do you do with a packet that has a bad checksum? You can either include it in the information that you're displaying to the law enforcement agency, um, or you can, you can throw it out. If you include it, uh, it, it could confuse the law enforcement agency. The, the guy who is being tapped could generate a bunch of extra data with bad checksums, knowing that it will never reach its destination in order to provide a bunch of cover traffic that basically um, uh, you know, misdirects the person who's surveilling them. Uh, if you choose not to include it, then the guy who's being surveilled can send all of his traffic with bad checksums and just configure the computer on the other end not to do the checks. Uh, so it, it's, um, it's a difficult and interesting uh, uh, issue, um, and, and I, I, again, I recommend reading about it, but it's not what I'm covering in this talk. What I'm talking about is unauthorized access. And there are two uh, sort of different kinds of unauthorized access you need to be concerned with. The first is making sure that people who are not authorized to provision a wiretap cannot do so. 
Um, and the second is to make sure that the people who are authorized to provision a wiretap are only collecting the data that they were actually authorized to collect. They're, they got a warrant to look at Bob's stuff, they only collect Bob's stuff and not Carol's stuff. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about gaining unauthorized access. This is a, uh, a network map. It's an example network uh, that, that uh, just kind of shows you how this looks when it's actually deployed in an ISP's environment. Um, there's this I, 